Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Okay, everybody, sit back, take a deep breath, take a couple of deep breaths, actually. We're going to have a little moment of zen, and then we're going to start talking about the pistol brace rule. Now, I apologize for being late to the party. One would think that a person who did a video that predicted that the rule would be published on Friday, January 13th, would have cleared their calendar on Friday, January the 13th, but no. Instead, that individual ran around like a chicken with their head cut off being a lawyer all day and was not able to really get to this the first time until last night when I did a live shoot with Kyle Metcalf over at Security Gun Club. But I think that this ability for me to go through and kind of slowly digest this, why a lot of other people here in the YouTube universe have been out given you a lot of ideas about how you should think about this is probably going to be beneficial. So let's all just slow it down for a minute. We're going to take it down. We're going to break it down to its most simplest forms. And I'm not going to tell you guys how to think about this rule. I'm just going to give you all the stuff that I think you should think about. So let's play it right down the middle today. Let's get you educated about what this all really means to you. So today, let's spend a few very important minutes and talk about what does ATF's new pistol brace rule really mean to you? Okay, so the issue we're talking about is the pistol brace rule. And again, I do apologize for being late to the party, but I want to kind of take it slow, break this all down so that we can break it down in simple English, give it to you so that you, the lawful and responsible gun owner nationwide, can understand what the hell this really means to you. Some caveats, okay? I want to give you some caveats before we get too far down the road. Number one, there is a lot here, okay? 292, uh, 296, yeah, 292 pages of material. I have gotten through all of it, um, but if I was going to go through all of it and get you guys all up to speed on everything, this thing would be probably about a four-hour video. So we're going to be breaking this down, doing it in little chunks, okay? Uh, another caveat, okay, is a lot of times I think that when people watch this channel and they see me ed educating people about what the rule is or what the ATF said, that I am somehow or another either A, endorsing the rule or B, uh, speaking on behalf of or endorsing the statements of the ATF, okay? Nothing is, can be further from the truth, all right? I am not endorsing this rule whatsoever. I do not think this is good rulemaking. I do not think this is legislation. I do. I think this is legislation. Yes, it's unconstitutional legislation. This is supposed to be done by Congress, but we're not even going to get into that today, okay? So understand that. Now, I recognize that a lot of you, and I, I saw, if I had a dollar for every one of these comments I saw last night during the live shoot, I will not comply. I will not comply. That is fine, okay? Understand here, again, at Washington Gun Law, we do not tell you how to think. You're all big boys and big girls. You can figure out how to think for yourself. Our job is to give you material to think about. What weight you attach to it, what value you attach to it, that is your prerogative. If you don't want to comply, if you don't want to color inside the lines, that is your God-given right. You can live the life as you wish. But we will inform you and educate you here at Washington Gun Law of what the consequences are should you be prosecuted for that type of activity. And then the third caveat is I'm trying to interpret what ATF is saying, and we're all trying to interpret what ATF is saying, and as we know, they are not the best in communication. So recognize that there are limitations, especially when you guys start asking questions down in the comment box below as to what is really the situation. Now, as I begin to learn more and educate myself more, I'm going to make sure that we educate you. We're going to break this rule down into four components today, okay? These are the four components I want to talk about. Number one, what is different about this rule as it was published yesterday versus the old version that we saw before, okay? Because that had a lot of people freaking out, and so we need to do a little comparison shopping as to which one's better or worse or either, okay? Number two, we need to tell you, just get you educated on technically how does the rule apparently going to start regulating AR pistols as short barrel rifles? Technically, from a legal aspect, how does it do that? And then also within that category, we need to talk about technically when does the rule become effective to you, the lawful and responsible gun owner, okay? Now, the third thing we're going to talk about is remedies. What do you need to do now? What might you need to do in the future? What can you do to avoid the rule? And we have actually done some videos on that, and we were guessing at it, but it appears that we our guesses were right on that one. And then the final thing is we're going to talk about what do you need to do right now, okay? So with that, let's get rolling. 
Okay, the big difference between this version of the rule and the previous version is the very rapid death of ATF Form 4999. The four-point scale, the Form 4999, is officially no more. It is done. And I will tell you that there was, by the way, on a side note, there was, I think, 237,000 comments. Only 20,000 of those comments were in support of this rule. So that means that 217 were opposed to it. Now, of the 20,000 comments, though, that were in support of this rule, uh, 18,000 of them were identical letters, a form letter by some organization that sent all these letters in on behalf of other individuals. So basically, you're talking about 2001 letters of support in favor. Of it. Now, the biggest level of criticism in all of the comments happened to do with Form 4999, and the ATF, in a shocking moment of clarity, actually acknowledged it. On page 9 of the proposed rulemaking, this is what ATF states. After careful consideration of the comments received regarding the complexity and understanding the proposed worksheet 4999 and the methodology used in the worksheet to evaluate firearms equipped with a brace device, this final rule does not adopt some aspects of the approach proposed in the NPRM, specifically the worksheet 4999 and its point system. And by the way, if you see the letters NPRM, that is Notice of Proposed Rule Making, that is the previous version. So, the form 4999 is dead. Hallelujah. Does that mean all the scoring criteria that was on Form 4999 is also dead? No, au contraire. It is actually quite the opposite because this now as we move into the second thing, what is how does this law technically do what it purports to do? What does it purport to do? Well, it wants to regulate pistols with attached stabilizing braces to determine which ones are actually designed to be uh, designed or intended to be fired from the shoulder, which then, since they have barrels less than 16 inches, we're dealing with a short barrel rifle to be regulated by the National Firearms Act of 1934, okay? Now, how does it technically do that? Well, this is where you could say that Form 4999 in its original form is dead, yes. However, there are many characteristics of 4999 that have now been recodified as part of the definitional section of rifle in 27 CFR 4788.11 and 479.11. So essentially, if you were to look at 27 CFR 478.11, you see a statute looks just like this, okay? And what this does now is it adds all of this new sections here into the definitional section found in CFR. So what the, what they're essentially doing is, is the ATF is saying, listen, we believe that there are ambiguities in the definition of terms used to define rifle. Okay. And because of that, it, we, the ATF, are tasked with redefining or clarifying those ambiguities. Okay. The ambiguities or what they're talking about is that the definition in 26 United States Code 5845 is vague, okay? And this is what they're saying is because that definition is vague, we need to further clarify it with additional codes of federal regulation. Now, the statute that's in play here defines rifle as follows. The term rifle means a weapon designed or redesigned, made or remade, and intended to be fired from the shoulder and designed or redesigned and made or remade to use the energy of the explosive in a fixed cartridge to fire only a single projectile through the rifle bore for each single pull of the trigger and shall include any such weapon which may be reasonably restored to fire a fixed cartridge. And what ATF and the Department of Justice is saying is, is hey, this beginning of the definition, this section right here, a weapon designed or redesigned, made or remade, and intended to be fired from the shoulder. And that's the thing. What do we mean when a firearm is intended or designed to be fired from the shoulder? That, according to the Department of Justice, is vague and needs further clarification. What they're doing is, is they're taking large chunks of Form 4999, adding it to the definition of the rifle, saying, listen, if there is a rearward a device, like a stabilizing brace, attached there too, then we may have a rifle depending on the following criteria. 
So specifically, what the Department of Justice is saying here now is that there'll be a sub-definition right here in Rifle that will read as follows. Designed or redesigned, made or remade, and intended to be fired from the shoulder includes a weapon that is equipped with an accessory component or other rearward attachment, for example, a stabilizing brace, that provides surface area that allows the weapon to be fired from the shoulder provided other factors as listed in the amended regulations and described in this preamble indicate that the weapon is designed, made, and intended to be fired from the shoulder. Okay, so if it has an attached stabilizing brace with a surface area which could be shouldered, there is a chance we have a short barrel rifle depending on the rest of these criteria, okay? And this now is where we see $49.99 rear its ugly head again, this time now in the Code of Federal Regulations, because the criteria that the Department of Justice, ATF, will look at are as follows. One, whether the weapon has a weight or length consistent with the weight or length of a similarly designed rifle. And if you go back and you take a look at the prerequisite section on Form 4999, we knew a couple of things. Number one, the firearm had to weigh at least 64 ounces, or what we like to call four pounds, because the ATF made a determination that if it was less than four pounds, you didn't need a stabilizing brace. And then it also had to be at least 12 inches in length and less than 26 inches in length, because ATF had themselves determined that that was a little sweet spot where it was long enough that you might need a stabilizing brace, but not too long that a stabilizing brace would not work. So that's the first criteria. Now, there are obviously many more criteria, including two, whether the weapon has a length of pull measured from the center of the trigger to the center of the shoulder stock or other rearward accessory component or attachment, including an adjustable or telescoping attachment, with the ability to lock into various positioning along a buffer tube, receiver extension, or other attachment method that is consistent with similarly designed rifles. And if we're using ATF's old 4999 as a guideline, the old criteria was anything 10 and a half inches or less was zero points, 10 and a half to 11 and a half inches was one point. And if you just take it on inch by inch increments as the length pull, 11 and a half to 12 and a half being worth two points and so forth, you can see what the old criteria was. Now, in addition to that, Department of Justice also states the other criteria includes Three, whether the weapon is equipped with sights or a scope with eye relief that require the weapon to be fired from the shoulder in order to be used as design. And we've talked about this. Certain types of optics that will only work if the firearm is shouldered versus those that can be used if the firearm is shouldered or extended on one arm. In addition to that, other criteria include whether the surface area that allows the weapon to be fired from the shoulder is created by a buffer tube receiver extension, or any other accessory component or other rearward attachment that is necessary for the cycle of operations. And this is where I think you begin to see a little bit of a difference between the AR platform and the AK platform. The AR platform, of course, having the buffer tubes right there, that is absolutely necessary for the cycle of operations. In addition to that, the other criteria include Five, the manufacturer's direct and indirect marketing and promotional materials indicating the intended use of the weapon. Now, that is a big new one. And this is where all of these companies, SB Tactical, who makes fantastic products, but when you go back and you look at their old marketing material, if they got photos of people shouldering the firearms, trust me, the ATF was going to use that to make a determination that that is exactly what that brace is designed for. The final criteria is... Six, information demonstrating the likely use of the weapon in the general community. And that is your catch-all, right? Which is like, well, okay, we don't really see any of the other criteria, but we've heard rumors that people shoulder this. And so you begin to see the actually arbitrary and capricious nature of how ATF can enforce this rule. They just don't do it through Form 4999 anymore. They now do it through additional definitions of firearms, rifles, by adding right here to the Code of Federal Regulations. Okay, the other thing we got to talk about, of course, is when would, when does this rule technically go into effect? It's 120 days from the date of publication. Now, I inadvertently last night during the live chat said that last night was the date of publication. Incorrect. I was wrong. The date of publication will be sometime this coming week. 120 days is the date 
from uh, from that is the date that this uh, rule will go into effect. However, there's a huge exception in FFLs. FFLs, you need to be really, really aware of this. This is on page 14 of this rulemaking order, okay? It's for you, the rule goes into effect immediately. However, they have given you a 60-day grace period to get your inventory and all of that into compliance and things such as that. So FFLs, I will be doing a separate video just for you guys to geek out on, but you need to be aware that's on page 14 of the rulemaking order. Okay, what can you do now and what can you do in the future? Okay, ATF has basically said there are several ways that you can bring your firearm into compliance and not have to deal with any of this crap. Now, you're going to see that there really is not a lot of good options here. And to quote Lindsey Graham, this might be getting the chosen between getting shot or getting poisoned, okay? But here are your options. First of all, if you have a firearm that you believe under this new rulemaking, under this new definition of rifle, now constitutes a federally regulated short barrel rifle, you can, of course, destroy the firearm, okay? Um, why you would do that, I don't know, but that is an option. You can also just call your friendly ATF agents and have them swing on by and pick it up, and you can surrender the firearm to them, okay? The third thing is you can actually submit the firearm uh, for a determination by ATF. Now, this is really important. There is a huge laundry list of very common models that fall into these platforms that have already been determined by ATF. You will see a laundry list of those that uh, do not qualify and a very short list of those that do make it under the bell. However, and this is really, really important, understand that if you submit a sample and that particular firearm is okayed as a AR pistol, or a, a pistol with a stabilizing breech attached to it, it, that determination is only good for that exact firearm. So even if there were 50 other firearms of the same make and model in that same neighborhood, that determination is only good for that one exact firearm because obviously people do change components and configurations of firearms. That's one of the great things about the AR platform. So that would not count towards any other qualification and then of course the last thing you can do is you can just say well you know what i probably do have a federally regulated sbr i can go ahead and fill out a form one and i can register this firearm as an nfa item you have 120 days from the date in which the rule is published so roughly 120 days from sometime this coming week to get the application submitted. Now, I know a lot of you freaking out. Well, I'm not going to have it approved within 120 days. No, you are not going to have it approved. If you got your application in right this second, yeah, you might have a chance of having it approved, but I don't think so. But here's the deal. I think a lot of people, and deservedly so, are going to sit around and watch this for the next 30 to 60 days to watch the lawsuits, the litigation, the injunctions, and everything happen, okay? And so if there isn't movement in one direction or another, what you're going to do is have a huge influx of Form 1 filings, I believe, the last 60 days of this 120-day window. Inevitably, the system will crash. It will crash under its own weight. And most people will not be approved. However, ATF has made it clear in this rule that as long as the application has been submitted within that 120 days, ATF will de de deem you to be in lawful possession up until the time ATF makes a determination about this. And then, of course, there is the $200 tax stamp, which if you submit your form within the 120-day window, the ATF will not be charging you the tax stamp. It is so benevolent of them. I know all of you are very gracious. Again, I'm not sticking up for the ATF here. I'm just telling you what this new rule says. Okay, and then let's talk about what do I need to do right now. Right after I get done watching this video, what do I need to do? Well, right now, let's just all take a deep breath. Do you need to go cut your AR pistols up right now? No, you don't. Do you need to call your ATF agent, tell them, come on by and grab all of them? Why the hell would you ever do that? Should you just get in line right now and get your e-form one ready and get it rolled in and all that? Listen, I think there's a lot of clarification. I think there's a lot of things that are going to happen. And I think that the lawsuits are going to be coming out. I think a lot of these large groups, Gun Owners of America, Firearms Policy Coalition, Second Amendment Foundation, they will have plenty of briefs probably dropping 
this week. And so I think that for me, I'm going to personally wait at least 30, maybe 60 days, kind of see how things shake out before I really decide to do anything. Knowing that as long as if I really do get painted into that paperwork corner, as long as I have the form submitted by that 120 day, I am uh, in my safe haven. I'm guessing I'm in my amnesty at that point. That is what I'm doing, but that's what I'm doing. What you need to do is what's right for you, what's best for you and your family. Now, listen, I know you guys are going to have a ton of questions about this. And yes, we will continue to do videos. Go ahead and ask the questions because as we begin to see common questions, that gives us an idea that there's a lot of people who need to learn about that. And that gives us good topic for future videos. In the meantime, if you have any other questions about this or what's left of your Second Amendment rights, you guys know the drill. You can always contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com or you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now, in the meantime, let's remember, part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Law, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.